The digital edition of the 5e Dragonlance Shadow of the Dragon Queen pre-order has been delivered, and I've eagerly read through it pretty much in a day. I've been waiting for this book since the start of 5th edition, honestly, probably longer. I wasn't sure what the scope would be, and now that I've read it, I... I know when in Kryn's long history the book is set, but if you want more context about the world, this video is going to give you a whirlwind tour of the main plot points of Dragonlance Chronicles. Warning, this video contains nothing but spoilers. It's all spoilers. If you really want all of the lore, though, read at least Dragonlance Chronicles, that's the original three books, and then Legends, that's the sequel trilogy. There's a lot more, though, if you want more. But this video is going to give you the basics. The world of Dragonlance is Kryn, that's the planet, and it's impossible to talk about Kryn without acknowledging that in a way it's a world of two times. Kryn itself has a very clear timeline, which is recorded meticulously by the scribe Astinus of Palanthus. However, everyone on Kryn knows that there was a world-changing disaster a few hundred years ago. The true gods of the world were forgotten, their clerics disappeared off the face of the planet, as did the good metallic dragons. The oceans rose, the lands shifted, and Kryn would never be the same. It's called the Cataclysm, and basically everything on Kryn is spoken of in terms of before the Cataclysm and after the Cataclysm. In fact, the calendar starts at AC, after Cataclysm. In the AD&D 2nd Edition sourcebook for Dragonlance, there were two maps of, of Kryn, the one before the Cataclysm and then the one after. Even world maps in the game world are catching up to changes in the world. It's not uncommon for explorers to venture out to a city that they thought was a port city and find that it's actually buffeted by dry land now. The 5e Dragonlance product, like the original trilogy, takes place post-Cataclysm, during a terrible war sparked by the invasion of the evil five-headed dragon goddess Tachesis. Dragons of Autumn Twilight. A group of friends reunite in the idyllic treetop town of Solus after five years of having gone their separate ways on personal quests. They are Tannis Half-Elven, he's a half-elf, Qualinesti, which is the elf uh, the, the high elf sort of race on Kryn, and human. Flint Fireforge, Mountain Dwarf originally from Thorbarden. Tasselhoff Burfoot, a halfling, or kender as they're called on Kryn, from Kindermore. Sturm Brightblade, a human from the regal principality of Salamnia. Karaman Majir, Fistendantilus, I mean Raistlin Majir, Kitiara Uthmatar, uh, except that Kitiara doesn't actually turn up, she sends a note saying that she's busy with some gig that she got as a mercenary. A and Raistlin shows up as a full-blown red wizard, not of Thay, that's Forgotten Realms, but he's got strange golden skin and hourglass eyes. Anyway, this fellowship finds the once peaceful region that they called home dominated by a religious zealot, the High Theocrat, and strange lizard folk, actually draconians. When two barbarians, Gold Moon and her fiancé River Wind, are unjustly assaulted by the local authorities, our heroes pledge their aid, becoming instant enemies of the state, and kicking off the adventure. Lots of adventure happens, with the group eventually reaching the ancient city of Zak Saroth. A black dragon dwells there now, and in a battle it kills River Wind one of the barbarians. Miraculously, though, Gold Moon, the other barbarian, is able to channel the power of the long-forgotten goddess Mishakal to resurrect Riverwind. This makes Gold Moon the first true cleric since the Cataclysm. It's a book-shifting event. It changes the way things work in the books and in the world. Raistlin, the young wizard, acquires an ancient spellbook from the ruins of Zak Saroth, and so he too levels up. A few new companions. Along the way, the heroes pick up a few new friends. Gilthanus, a childhood friend of Tanis. Lorana, a former girlfriend of Tanis. Tika Wayland, a waitress from Solas. And Fizban, a bumbling old man who claims to be a great wizard, but can rarely remember his own name, much less his own spells. Showdown. Lots of more stuff happens, but in the end it becomes apparent that there's a full-scale war brewing. Strange new corrupted beings, the, the Draconians, they, they were born of dragon eggs stolen from good dragons, and they're invading to make way for their evil queen. 
the Dragon High Lord Verminard is leading an army of red dragons to conquer Abyssinia. And these Dragon High Lords, they, they ride the dragons. They actually get onto the dragons and ride them around. Kryn doesn't stand a chance, but the heroes do what they can, at least taking a stand against the oncoming army. With the help of the unlikeliest of allies, they manage to convince a senile ancient red dragon, Mataflur, that the nearby dragon high lord, Verminard, is threatening her children. Well, her children are actually long dead, but she doesn't remember that. There's a final battle, Verminard and his dragon are killed, and the region is saved. For now. Book 2, Dragons of Winter Night. This book is mostly Sturm's. In it, Sturm Brightblade decides to return to the homeland that exiled him as a child, to earn his official place as a knight, and to help fight the dragon invasion. Along the way, he meets Alhana Starbreeze, a Sylvanesti elf, who bestows him with a magical token of her affections. That's not important, I just mentioned it. Forget I ever said it. Alhana Starbreeze happens to be the daughter of Lorak, the speaker of the Sylvanesti, or, or king of the elves, and she's heading home to find her father. To get there, the heroes must brave haunted lands full of undead and living nightmares. And it's here that literally the rest of the Dragonlance story is revealed. Through a series of visions, each hero and the reader sees the future, and it's not a trick. You really do find out how the story ends, although without context, it's pretty confusing and very misleading. When they find Lorak, the king of the Sylvanesti elves, they discover that he's essentially melded with an orb of dragon kind. Yes, the one from the Dungeon Master's Guide. The orb has taken over Lorak's mind, and that's what caused the surrounding land to become haunted and corrupt. Huma, dragons, and knights. As they leave familiar if not haunted territory, the heroes meet Silvara, a Kaganesti, that's a wood elf, guide who takes them to the ancient burial site of Huma. A war hero from before the Cataclysm, Huma Dragonbane was the bearer of a mythical dragon lance, and is credited with defeating the evil dragon forces long, long ago. Some drama happens, and eventually Silvara and Gilthanus fall in love. But she has to reject him in the end, because she turns out to be a silver dragon named Darjant, which reveals that the good dragons are not gone from Kryn. Could the good dragons unite and help Kryn fight the evil dragons? There's hope yet. Fizban and Tasselhoff visit Mount Nevermind, a gnome fortress factory, to try to learn more about the dragon orbs. Sturm goes to Salamnia to earn the title of knighthood, only to find that the remnants of the Salamnic Order is in disarray. There's infighting, greed, pride. It's reduced the once great order into a bureaucratic and self-serving institution, incapable of defending even its own homeland. Knighthood or not, Sturm goes to defend his homeland against the oncoming blue dragon army. He stands alone on a tower, his father's sword in his hand, and fights to buy Tasselhoff and Lorana time as they uncover a dragon orb and a dragon lance from deep underneath a castle. Sturm falls to the dragon high lord Kitiara, yes, the same Kitiara who used to spar with him in Solace and who didn't show up at the beginning of the books. But he lasted long enough that Tasselhoff and Lorana have recovered a dragon orb and a dragon lance, possibly the keys to raising an army to fight for Kryn. While all that's happening, Tannis is captured, but is quickly recognized by Kitiara, who invites him into her army and her bedchambers. He doesn't argue, and succumbs to the allure of the dark side. Lorana leads what's left of the local army to liberate some key cities, uh, becoming a war hero and a, a full-fledged general as a result. Book 3, Dragons of Spring Dawning. Tannis, Flint, Tasselhoff, Karaman, Tika, and Raistlin board a ship to get out of the occupied city of Flotsam. That's where Tannis was sort of being held, quote-unquote, captive by Kitiara in her bedroom. Unfortunately, there's a shipwreck, but they're rescued by Apoletta, a beautiful Demernesti, a sea elf, uh, although Raistlin abandons them all and just teleports himself to Palanthus, where he studies ancient tomes to become an even more powerful wizard. We learn that Kitiara has made a bargain with a death knight named Lord Soth, 
in her progress toward power. The terms of the agreement are a little unclear, as I recall, but it comes around, it comes up later in in some in the in the next trilogy. In the meantime, Gothanus and Lorana learn from Silvara, the the silver dragon Darjant, that Takesis keeps her brood of stolen dragon eggs in Naraka, an underground volcanic lair. This is also where her army is headquartered. As described in Shadow of the Dragon Queen, there are five dragon high lords, one for each color of evil dragon, and each one of these high lords leads an army of, of those dragons. Takesis encourages inner conflict, believing that only the strongest contender for the title of dragon high lord should, in fact, lead an army. The city of Kalaman is the capital of the Salamnic province of Nightland. It's detailed in Chapter 4 of Shadow of the Dragon Queen, and it becomes the target of Takesis's wrath. Lorana and Tasselhoff are kidnapped, Lorana as a bargaining token. Flint Fireforge dies of a heart attack as the heroes search for Lorana. The remaining party invades Naraka, Tanis giving himself up in exchange for Lorana. He pretends to rejoin Kitiara as her lover and conspirator. At the last moment, though, Tanis is able to kill Takesis's general, Ariakas, throwing the army into a sudden internal power struggle. Raistlin appears at the last moment, wearing the black robes now, not the red robes, but the black robes of evil wizards, and repays his debts to Tanis and his brother Karaman and to, to everyone who's ever helped him. The forces of Takesis are in disarray, Naraka falls, and at last the war is over. Kryn is at peace. But the question remains, has balance between the good, neutral, and evil gods been restored? Not surprisingly, this isn't by any means the whole story of the Dragonlance Chronicles series. I haven't mentioned the Gully Dwarves, and the, well, although they're not in the Shadow of the Dragon Queen, so I guess they're not a thing in 5e. I skipped the part where Tasselhoff breaks a dragon orb, and a bunch of stuff about riding dragons, and the battles fought with the Dragon Lances. I barely mention anything about Karaman, or Tika, or Elistan. I didn't even mention Elistan. There's so much good story in the first three books. Go read them yourself. They're awfully good. You'll get to know these characters as close personal friends. I've gone back to these books time and time again over the years. They're my default fantasy read. Give them a try. They might become yours.